Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to the second Indo-Brazilian webinar. The topic today is proximal humerus fractures. And to introduce today's speakers, I would hand over to our moderator, Dr. Sergio Rovinsky, for all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Okay, so can I start now? Yes. Can I go? Okay, so uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all here. I'm very happy uh, for this second Indo-Brazilian Shoulder Planet and Ortho TV webinar. Uh, 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 today, we are talking about a very interesting team, which is always on the move, which is proximal humerus fractures. And we have here, I'm very happy because we could, we could pick up a big constellation of Star Wars all over the planet from Brazil, from India, to give different perspectives and different points of view in this very interesting team. So let me do a short introduction of our presenters, and then uh, they will say hello to, to, to everybody, and then we can start. So for, uh, as everybody know, I live here in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. Uh, and I have here from my city, Sao Paulo, one of the most relevant shoulder surgeons from, the, from Sao Paulo and from Brazil, Dr. Eduardo Carrera. Dr. Carrera not only was the president of uh, Brazilian Shoulder and Elbow Society in 2010, but a very active guy here in my country. He uh, has been for many years the chief of the shoulder and, and, and elbow uh, team from Federal University of Sao Paulo, where I graduated. And he was my boss, actually, about 15 years ago. He taught me a lot of things about proximal humerus fractures, concepts, theoretical concepts, a very good teacher, uh, and a very skilled surgeon, not only in, in, in open uh, uh, surgery, but also in arthroscopy. Uh, we still have here, I would say, a, a very big star from India, Dr. Sanjay Desai, which is known by almost every orthopedic sh shoulder surgeon. Hello, sir. Namaste, namaskar. And he has a big, and uh, as I like to say, he has a supermarket list of titles. He has been the president of Indian Arthroscopy Society, the president of Indian Shoulder Society. He runs a lot of, of other societies too, mm -hmm. a lot of experience and a different way of seeing uh, proximal humerus fractures, especially when we talk about nailing. Still, I have here my very good friend who is helping me in the Zindo Brazilian Endeavour since the very beginning, Dr. Ildeu Almeida. Dr. Ildeu Almeida is a very skilled shoulder surgeon, a very good academicist. He does elbow too. He was the president of uh, uh, Brazilian Shoulder and Elbow Society last year, 2019. And also, he was one of the organizers of the world, uh, the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery last year in Buenos Aires, he was there. So a very active man. He's not gonna present uh, a, a, a lecture uh, today, but he's gonna help us in uh, moderating. So I'm very happy to pick up together all of these big stars and all of, and still, Nothing of that would be uh, happening here without the support of Ortho TV in the persons of Niraj Bijlani and Dr. Ashok Shyam. So before we start, I just want to be presenters to say hello, Dr. Yudeu, as you are always with me in this in this end of work, just say uh, uh, just say your uh, hello to all of our, uh, our delegates, please. Good afternoon to the Indians. And good morning to the Brazilians. It's a, uh, I'm very honored to be part of this second webinar in the Brazil. And we're going to have uh, great lectures because uh, I know uh, that these, these professors that we have today, they are uh, great. And I, I am very uh, uh, anxious for these presentations. Thank you again. Oh, very good. Dr. Sanjay, you are the biggest star, but Please just say hello to, to everybody, sir. Good morning to all my friends in Brazil and uh, also uh, good afternoon to all my friends in India. Uh, I think it's a great association and both the countries have a lot of similarities, very loving people like Sergio. Uh, and I look forward to an exciting afternoon. Thank you for having me. Lovely, lovely. And now Dr. 
Carrera, which is the, uh, which has a tremendous experience in proximal humerus fractures and besides in shoulder uh, in shoulders stuff. Just uh, your your final uh, your uh, first word, sir. Good morning for everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with those guys, those friends with me. Thank you very much. Okay, lovely. So uh, the thing is, the idea here is we will start with Dr. Carrera. Just for everybody to, to, uh, to understand, uh, we will do, a, a Dr. Carrera will do a, a presentation, a, a lecture about his points of view. And after that, Dr. Sanjay, and we will shortly start discussing cases because we have many interesting things to discuss. Just for everybody to understand, Dr. Carrera has a very peculiar uh, uh, view on proximal humerus fractures. I learned so much with him and not only the ideas, but the, the tricks and the tips that I use nowadays. I learned it with uh, some guys, but he was very important to me in this point. And his ideas on compressive and non-compressive fractures are very important in my point of view. And he's a plater. And Dr. Sanjay, he's, he has a lot of experience with nailing. So we will have different points of view and then we can start discussions just after the presentation. So Dr. Carrera, you can start your lecture uh, right now, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm not able. Are you? Can you see my presentation? No, Dr. Carrera, uh, you can you do a share screen button? Can you see? Yeah, share screen? I'm trying. So but, come hello. to the Zoom window. Come to the Zoom window. Yeah, but it's not going on. There is a share screen button. Just escape from the keynote first. É, sai do Keynote, entra no, no, no Zoom e entra em compartilhar tela. Yes, I did. <laughs> Can you see our videos? Oh, I don't know what is happening. Yeah, yeah here it is. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, just, just yeah, one thing. That? So just one thing be before he starts, uh, I would ask all of uh, me and, and Dr. Sanjay to stop sharing the screen because the internet will be better for, for everybody to Dr. Carrera. As he finishes, we, we come back with, with our uh, videos, okay? Thank you. Okay, you can, can I start. start the presentation? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank all my colleagues that are in this presentation, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to speak together with Dr. Sanjay. And thank you for my friends from Brazil, and then Dr. Nirai and Dr. Asha. Thank you for the invitation, it's an honor for me. Thank you very much. And sorry about my English, but I, I expected that you can understand, understand me. Well, as Dr. Sergio said before, uh, I have a new point of view uh, to treat the proximal humeral fracture. So my intention here is to present uh, a new point of view, how I read this kind of fractures in the proximal uh, humeral, humerus fractures. In other words, I uh, would like to show you what happens with these kind of fractures? Uh, how I see the different fractures in the proximal humeral? Well, I would like to answer these questions after the presentation. Uh, what happens with uh, the different types of fractures? And what is the most important difference between them? And finally, what makes the treatment difficult because we can see some fractures that goes well and some of them 
there's, that goes very bad, it's very difficult to treat. Well, first of all, I, use, I, I would like to remember the near classification. Sorry, it's written in Portuguese, but I think all of us know this classification that consider two, three, and four parts. Okay, if I ask you to classify these fractures, I think there is not uh, a big difficult to understand that those fractures you, you can classify in two or three parts. Okay, it's not difficult. But if I ask you to classify this kind of fractures, it seems a little bit more difficult. In the upper part of the video, in the left, how many parts, how many fragments can you find in this fracture? Or in the next one, it's difficult to classify. This is a, a, a classify that if you use just the X-ray, it seems very difficult. So then there, there, is, there are some uh, authors that want to do a new classification to understand better what happens with these fractures. Like Dr. Half Hertel, he used the logo classification and then later, Dr. Herbert Hesch tried to make another classification, but in my opinion, this is one of the most difficult classification to understand. This uh, tell me that uh, the surgeons are not uh, satisfied with those classification because we cannot understand very well what happened with these fractures. So I ask again, what happens with, what is the difference between those fractures? Uh, and what makes these fractures different? What is important in this kind of fractures? And why one treatment is more difficult than others? So I would like to, to tell you this kind of fractures we have, I think you agree with me, there are fractures in two, part three and four parts. I think everybody agree with me. Okay, so what we, we can see the difference between those factors. I propose to change the position. If you change the four part fracture in the upper part of the left side to the two part in the lower part of this slide, you change the position and you can see my, my propose in the right side. Okay, so we have this, this situation, okay? And what is the difference between those factors in my point of view that I think is very, very important that the fracture in the upper part are not impacted fracture. And the fractures in the lower are impacted fractures. This make the difference between those fractures. This is my point of view. Uh, this I would like to, to transmit to you, to teach to you. You have to pay attention in this kind of fractures. This make the difference when you will treat this kind of fractures. So it's like this, what is similar in those fractures? There is no compression between the fragments. They are not impacted. There is no bone loss in the metaphysis area of the humerus. And what is the difference between the, the first fractures and now is in this kind of fracture, you have compression in the bone, in, in the metaphysis bone, and they are impacted fractures. You have bone loss. This is the most important point in my presentation, I think. So I propose to understand the fractures. Instead, you can see if they are two, three, or four parts, but you have to recognize that the fractures. Uh, if they if they are impacted or not impacted fractures. 
you see these kind of fractures. In the left side, they are not impacted, and in the right side, they are impacted fractures. Almost all two-part fractures are not impacted, and almost all four-part fractures are impacted fractures. So can we uh, begin to, to understand this question? What, what happens with the different types of fractures? The difference is if you have impaction, if you, if you have bone loss or not, what is the most important difference? Is, is that the, the most important difference between the fractures are uh, one fracture, there is no bone loss, and another one, you have bone loss in the impacted fractures. This makes uh, treatment difficult because when you reduce, when you put the fragments in the anatomical uh, position, there is no bone loss in the metaphysis area, and this makes difficult the treatment. You maybe you will understand better when I'm, I show the clinical cases. It's not for discussion now, but uh, just to, to clarify, to, to uh, think better what happens. So when you don't have impact, uh, compression between the fragments, you can assemble the fragments and you can fix with a plate, with wire, doesn't matter is these kinds of factors are easier to treat. This is my point. So it's like an, any kind of fracture in the femur, in the tibia, uh, anywhere. If you recognize, if you can see all fragments, you put all together in the anatomical position, you assemble, assemble them and fix with plates. Like in this case, you reduce, and fix with this plate is a, is a modification, is a kind of plate that I did. And I can show later if, if somebody has uh, uh, some doubts about this plate, but it's a nice plate. We can find a very good fixation. And this is another one case. You can see the fragments, you recognize all fragments, you put in the anatomical position and you fix. But when you have a, a compression in the metaphysis uh, area, you lose bone, as you see in this picture. If you can compare with the near classification, I could say there is a fifth fragment, not two, three, four part, and five part also, because the metaphysis bone is, is disappear, is a virtual. Uh, fragment. So you have to know that, you have to consider to treat these kind of fractures. This makes it difficult to treat these kind of fractures. As you can see in this, in this design, you have a compression in the metaphysis, and then when you reduce, you have a gap that needs to be filled with bone graft, with cement, wherever, or one plate like you are seeing here. That is my propose. Well, if you consider these kind of fractures, these impacted fractures also, I use to, to, to divide in three types. I call lateral because I consider the shaft in relation to the, the humeral head, because depending of the rotation, you can find some, uh, you, can, you can see a change from a lateral from a virus to a valgus fracture. So I prefer to say the shaft is lateral, considering the humeral head, or the central, that is the, the ice cream uh, fracture, as described by Nier, and the medial one that is, in my opinion, the worst fracture to treat because it's the most difficult to reduce, as I will show later. So in this uh, clinical case, you can see a compression in the second picture in the upper part, you can see a compression of this kind of fracture. When you put, when you reduce this fragment, you need to fill 
with the plate, with, with a bone graft, or whatever. So if you don't do that, you can you can have a cutout of these screws. Uh, you can have a virus deform it in post-operatory. Like this one, this is ice cream uh, fracture. You reduce and you fill the uh, defect, the gap between the humeral head and the shaft with this kind of plate. Or you can use bone graft, doesn't matter. But I use this plate that makes much more easy uh, the, the treatment of those fractures. So uh, my propose for you to understand uh, that you have, you need to consider that you can find impacted fractures and non-impacted fractures. Okay, like this, those not impacted fracture that you can reduce, assemble all fragments and the impacted fracture that, that you lose fragments. As you can see here, one more. And that is my point. That is my proposal in this presentation. Uh, I, I would like you to take home that you need to pay attention in the compression fracture, in the impacted fracture, when you have bone loss and in the fractures that you don't have compression between the fragments. You can assemble all fragments. So in my opinion, uh, doesn't matter if you have a two, three or four part fracture. The problem is when you find compression between the fragments, this makes the fractures difficult. This is the point. Okay, I would like to, to show you this. This is my point of view. If you, you want, if somebody wants to, to search some, some papers, I, I wrote this paper uh, doing a, comp a comparison between those two plates uh, for non-impacted fractures. And I present also some case, my, my follow-up in the uh, EFOR Congress in Copenhagen, in Denmark in, in, in 2011. Uh, and then I made this paper in a newspaper in Brazil from my hospital, Albert Einstein. And also uh, I published this kind of uh, paper showing the difference between those fractures as I showed before. I thank you very much. That is my point of view. I would like to pass you and I hope you can understand. Okay, Sergio. Okay. Okay, so see everybody, uh, the thing is, a very nice lecture. Uh, I already knew some of the concepts of Dr. Tahir. I really like them, I use it in my practice. I just wanna make some short comments uh, and then Dr. Sanjay, he, can, uh, he will speak. But the thing is, I just want uh, the audience to understand because uh, we have many juniors uh, uh, here and uh, just to highlight some points, and then we, we can use them as we start the discussion uh, after Dr. Sanjay's uh, lecture. But, but the thing is, as Dr. Carrera has shown, things they go much, much more beyond two fragments, three fragments, or four fragments. The idea of the fifth fragment in the medial hinge, it's very important. And the thing is, uh, and uh, and another very important issue is that Dr. Carrera, and he can speak about that after that, I know because he has talked to me so many times, he worries too much about the height, not to lose in height in the, in, in the fracture, and this is very important. And as he has said, when we have these compressed fractures, not only, as he mentioned, we, we may have a cutout of the screws in the humeral head, but also we can have, and I'm sure he ag agrees with me, intra-articular penetration of the screws, 
which can lead to chondrolysis and is a very difficult uh, issue. So with his plate, we avoid this. And the idea of using, a, 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 I would say, a piece of bone, as he mentioned, is in the same, uh, is in the same way. But with his plate, the idea is that we have much less morbidity. So I think that these ideas are really to be considered. But we will discuss this with the uh, the cases. So thank you, uh, Dr. Carrera and Dr. Sanjay. Now we, we uh, need to. Sergio, oh. Sergio yeah. Carrera, yeah. can I can I compliment a little bit? Yes, sure, of course. That you 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 said a very important point in my opinion. That okay. is the the, the, height. Uh, the height. Sorry. The height. The altura. Yeah. The height. The height. Yeah. When you have a compression in this fracture. Sometimes it seems that the, the humeral head is in a good position, but yeah. if you lose the high, you have uh, an insufficient deltoid and an insufficient uh, rotator cuff. Yeah. This makes a bad result. You lose okay. movement, you lose power. Yeah. This is very important. Thank you for your uh, comment, Sergio. Thank you. Yeah, I know, I know. And and by the way, I learned these things with you a lot of time ago. But this is very important because we uh, for the juniors, it's not about only, it's not about, uh, there are three main ideas which go much more beyond the two or three fragments or four, which is the height, which is the head shaft relation and the cephalic diaphysial angle and to avoid uh, I, I really want the juniors to understand that we cannot have the humeral head going medial to the shaft, as Dr. Carrera said, because this is an invitation for verus. And verus leads to a lot of difficulties and, and loss of movement and even impingement. So uh, the idea of uh, paying attention to the medial hinge is very important. And I learned to call this the fifth fragment, and Dr. Carrera, you agree with the idea of having a lot of, I would say, attention to mount the medial hinge, huh? Sure? Yes, yes, I agree. You are right, completely right. Okay, lovely. So we will discuss this with the cases. Dr. Sanjay, now, now we just, wa just want to listen to you, sir. And you can share your screen, sir. Is my screen visible, guys? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation by Professor Kahira. And I enjoyed this concept of uh, compression leading to bone loss. And I fully agree with the importance of maintaining the height uh, once again, I thank all my friends in Brazil and, uh, and in India for this invitation. And I look forward to some interesting clinical case discussions as well. Now I begin my presentation with this slide to remind all my colleagues, especially the junior colleagues that 80% of the fractures of the proximal humerus are minimally displaced and they do very well with conservative treatment. So don't start operating on these. Here is an example. To me, it doesn't matter whether it is four part, five part or 40 part. What matters to me that it is minimally displaced. This is a 64 year old lady, mother of a gastroenterologist colleague. I conserved it. And this is the result at six months. And this is how the proximal humerus fractures will behave in 80% of cases. Why? Because they are minimally or undisplaced and they do well with conservative treatment. Point number one. So the real challenge is the remaining 15 or 20% of displaced fractures. And they are the ones which, which are a real challenge to get a similar result. And we have a whole list of treatment options available in the world market. And I'm going to present to you the results of a very unique 
device which is an intra medullary device called the just unique so first we must accept and i hope that my friends in brazil also have a similar experience that there is a problem with the current available methods of open reduction and internal fixation let me share some of the experience here in this part of the world example one a 73 year old gynecologist looks like a simple straightforward fracture somebody did a plating a locking plate and this is what happened and i bet that all of you have come across such examples example number 2 66 year old male four part fractures the tuberosities are flying and naturally this patient has a poor functional result example number 3 uh, an exotic kind of fixation it was a day one failure and it failed and this is what it looks like after removing the implant example number 4 again a unique kind of tension band wiring failed and example 5 6 7 8 9 i can go on and on the whole day with plating and failure now let's look at the international this trial which is uh, infamously famous the proper trial from england and what they said is that whether you operate or you don't operate on proximal humerus fractures the result is the same which shook the world now let's look at this in proper perspective i think it was a faulty trial they reported 250 cases and kindly note gentlemen they had 18 one part 128 two part and 104 three or four part so it's all mixed together how do you interpret such a study and more importantly what the prefer trial reveals that it's not that the results of conservative treatment are very good it basically implies that the results of internal fixation are so bad that even if you don't operate the result is the same so it reflects the poor results of internal fixation as it is today so why is this is such a difficult fracture to fix and plate there are many reasons the top 3 to me are that the head fragment is often a shell with osteoporotic bone very difficult to have any screws with solid purchase and the tuberosities are difficult to fix and retain in the position and this effectively leads to either a tuberosity non union mal union or a resorption the head fragment often falls into varus and with a avascular necrosis of the head so to me in this proximal humerus fractures the four part displaced fractures are a real challenge plating has shown some reasonable results when it is a two part or a three part but the real challenge to me is the four part displaced fracture and a fracture dislocation which is hard to get a good result with consistency so the world started doing hemi in four part fractures this is hemi example number 1 tuberosity gone hemi example number 2 done by somebody in this part of the world again tuberosity gone this is my own case number 3 tuberosity resolved this was a failed fixation which i did a hemi so therefore there is a problem with hemi as well this is not just my opinion there are many studies which show that hemi arthroplasty in four part fractures the tuberosity will misbehave in as high as 50% of cases that is very high failure rate and if the tuberosities do not heal then you are bound to have a poor function now my understanding after 25 years is these fractures are not doing well as of now with the current available methods of fixation because there is a failure in basic understanding of the biomechanics which <clears throat> professor kahera nicely displayed by his method of explaining between impacted and non impacted but 
our understanding of the biomechanics of the proximal humerus is not proper and therefore we need to innovate innovation is necessary and this is what i present to you ladies and gentlemen this is the intramedullary device if you see there is a circular staple this staple goes inside the fractured head and there is a stem which is intramedullary the stem has a sleeve you can increase or decrease the height of the stem what very importantly was brought out by sergio that it is important to maintain the height in these fractures to stop the head from collapsing and the screws cutting out as a result so this collapsible or extendable sheet allows you to maintain the height or achieve the appropriate height for the tuberosities to reduce in its anatomic position and the stem fits into the staple by a more stepper and the stem is uncemented this is the bilboke concept first thought of by professor dorzonian uh, a dear friend uh, from france so here is some some examples a 45 year old male a horrible fracture you can see that and it is a four part like i said it doesn't matter four or 40 but it's a displaced fracture he also had a vascular injury so i brought in a vascular surgeon he put a graft there in the brachial artery i mean in the axillary artery and we did the just unique implant this is 6 months post op i ch challenge you you show me a result like this that is possible with plate with a vascular injury he has almost 100% shoulder function and lo behold the head has not undergone a vascular necrosis he is now 3 years post op example number 2 68 year old right handed male displaced fracture of proximal humerus again i did a just unique implant like i said you can either extend the stem or shorten the stem because of the sleeve which locks in with a screw and by adjusting the height you allow the tuberosity to fit in in an anatomic position which is critical and the implant successfully maintains the height of the proximal humerus allowing the tuberosity to sit anatomically it is very simple and easy to do this operation 8 months post op this is the result united with excellent shoulder function example number 3 again a displaced fracture this is a this operation is done with a image intensifier c arm under fluoroscopy and this is 8 month post op constant score of 96 no avascular necrosis example number 4 this is like a head split fracture not an ideal case to do this just unique implant but i started becoming so comfortable with the implant that i went ahead and though it is a head split i managed to put one prong of the staple staple into that small fragment and the remaining into the large head fragment and here is the result at 10 months again no avascular necrosis the head split has united the tuberosity has united and he has a constant score of 90 example number 5 that's the same case i showed earlier somebody did a rush nail with tension band wiring naturally this had to fail i removed everything put the just unique implant and again that is the result that you see over there now i will show you a failure with this just unique implant the mistake i did is this surgery can be done with two approaches one is the superior mckenzie approach or the deltopectoral approach and usually i did the superior approach and i opened the shoulder using the superior approach and i therefore realized that i am unable to fix that butterfly fragment that you see in the shaft of the humerus and hence that's the butterfly fragment you can see on that x ray the ap view which i left unfixed leading to an unstable stem and therefore the surgery failed so from now on whenever i see that the fracture has extended into the shaft i would recommend and suggest that do a deltopectoral approach so that you can fix that fragment with whichever method you want whether it's a circlage or a interfract screw or whatever but you can stabilize it 
or do not use this implant if you feel that the stem is going to be unstable. The stem is supposed to be uncemented. So naturally, I had to revise this and I did a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So here is my experience. This is accepted for publication in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. Uh, that is the DOI number, 30 cases, uh, more than two year follow up. I had a union in 93.3%. None of the tuberosities, I had any resorption or non-union. Uh, the constant score average 74 and the American shoulder and elbow score of 75 at 25 month follow up. I had uh, two avascular necrosis of which one hardly had any symptoms, was tolerating it well, so we conserved. One had complaints of pain, we converted to a hemiarthroplasty. He did well. Why? Because the tuberosities had healed. This is the best part of this implant, that the tuberosities tend to sit anatomically with ease and therefore they tend to heal well. So as is published in literature by Christian Gerber, that if you have avascular necrosis after a proximal humerus fracture and the tuberosities have healed well, then these patients tend to be functionally quite reasonable and may not warrant any further arthroplasty. So failed just unique implant, one is poor selection of patient or a poor surgical technique and if the implant fixation is not adequate. When would I do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty? Usually in age 70 and above as a primary form of treatment. At the point I'm trying to make is the real challenge is in patients who are between uh, below the age of 70, where you do not want to do a hemiarthroplasty or a reverse. You want to preserve the head. Say in patients who are in late 40s, 50s and 60s, then I think this implant does a wonderful job. Do not take reverse shoulder arthroplasty very casually because we notice all of us that the number of reverse shoulder arthroplasties as of primary form of treatment for proximal humerus fractures is slowly rising. And therefore, this is a warning that in patients below 70, I would think hard before doing a reverse shoulder arthroplasty as a primary form of treatment because it can uh, lead you to a very difficult, uh, you may end up in a very difficult situation as you see over here. In conclusion, for displaced four-part fractures of proximal humerus, particularly in patients where you want to preserve the head, you need to think different. You need to think of just unique. Thank you once again, Brazil. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanjay. So, yes, sir. Thank, so see, thank you a lot. Uh, I love your lecture and you know, uh, everybody will speak and we will start discussing cases now, but I would just like to make some comments before we start discussing. Uh, I put it in order. Uh, and the first thing is, sir, as you have said, I have already had all of these complications. I'm very happy that it's not only in Brazil that they really happen. I have had all of these difficulties, various collapses, intra-articular penetration of screws. And I'm going to tell you something, sir, and I have been thinking about this last uh, two months. The thing is, I do a lot of uh, fractures all over the upper limb. And to be very honest with you, I feel more comfortable doing a terrible triad. I have a lot of experience in that too, than doing sometimes a difficult proximal humerus fracture because the complication, they really exist. And, uh, and especially loss of greater uh, tuberosity, which is a mess because if that happens, you will have a very bad final clinical result. And I just wanna make two more, uh, three very fast comments before we start discussing, and I just want to listen to Dr. Carrera and Dr. Ildeo too. First of all, sir, you told that in hemiarthroplasty, you have 50% of failure, okay? So in my practice, I have 100. I just want to highlight that. My results with hemi, they are catastrophical. I've been saying this for a lot of time. The Achilles tendon, the Achilles tendon of my shoulder practice with his huge is hemis. 
I'm very afraid of them and my failures, they are tremendous. But if you see there is a similarity in between your device and Dr. Carreras, uh, because you have something to hold the humoral head. And this is something that, to be very honest, we don't have in the philos. And this is why when you go to United States, and I've been there sometimes, you see big guys like Butch or like J.P. Warner talking about putting a tricortical iliac piece or a fibular strut, because they are doing the same thing as your uh, device, which is holding the head like that, and Dr. Uh, Carrera. So in this sense, you are winning the game. And, and, and we, which use a lot of philos, we are having difficulties. I have a lot of very good results with philos, uh, in spite of all of these issues, but there is a similarity in between your concept and Dr. Carreras. So I think it's very important for the juniors to understand that you having some metaphysical support is a key point in, I would say, compressed fractures, as, as Dr. Carrera has mentioned. And the, only, and the last thing that I just want to highlight, and then I want to listen to you guys before we start discussing, is that Dr. Sanjay has said something so important for the juniors. Reverse is not a panacea. We, uh, every junior, they think that reverse, I would say, is the heat of the moment and you can use it, but you have, you see, still you have to think about it, especially in patients less than 70 with not 70 plus, but 70 less as an exception whenever possible. I'm sure you agree with me, sir. So you see, so if you're talking about an 80, 82 year, year old patient, then it's different. We have a big hole from uh, for uh, reverses, even because in 78, 80 plus, the amount of osteoporotic bone is very high. And in these cases, doing a hemi is not needed because if you do a well done reverse, the patient is going to live more 10 years and the, the implant is going to live uh, more time than the patient. We say this, I learned that a lot of time ago. So you see, I think that juniors, they must understand that it's not a panacea about uh, uh, the use of uh, a reverse, especially when we are 70 less. But I really love it, all of this idea. And I know that before discussing, Dr. Ildeo, he's doing like this, he uh, agrees with me, hopefully, but I just want to know, Dr. Ildeo, about all of these things, your, your, uh, do you uh, agree with me? What do you think about that? Yes, uh, thanks for the presentations, uh, great ones. And I would like to make some comments about Dr. Carrera's comment, uh, presentation first, and then ask some questions to Dr. Sanjay about his device. And, for the juniors, and I, it's very important to understand that NIRS classification is a system. So as Dr. Carrera said, you do not use only the x-rays, but you are supposed to use the CT and even the surgery to classify the fracture. And based on your presentation, Dr. Carrera, as I understood, you seems to tell us that impaction is similar to stability. I don't know if I got it right, but I understand that sometimes impaction is not like stability. Uh, and sometimes I just understand the stability of the fracture during the procedure because it's something dynamic and that we can't understand only based on aesthetic images. Um, so uh, I agree very much indeed with your concept, but I think that we need to uh, try to understand the fracture just before the surgery using the image intensifier. That's what I like to do because sometimes the fracture seems to be very complex before the operation, but during the image intensifier, we understand that, wow, I can change it to a two-part fracture and fix it in the different way that I was thinking before. And uh, I agree very much, Sergio, that the, the two implants, they have a, a, a principle 
né? to, to keep the humoral head in a good high. But they, they, they have some uh, differences. And I, I, I would like to, to comment about uh, Dr. Sanjay's presentation. It's very interesting, your device, because uh, it seems that you can even convert it to a reverse. I don't know if you have uh, thoughts about that, because uh, you are uh, putting a, 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 a nail inside the, the, the humerus. And, and it's an uncemented. I understand that it's uncemented because you have to move inside that piece of metal to to have the the uh, normal height of the humeral head. But um, when you have these complex fractures involving the metaphysis, as it's not uh, uh, cemented, so the support for your device is the metaphysis. So in these cases. Do, do you believe that you can use a uh, uh, cemented uh, uh, nail, uh, uh, understanding the height before uh, to get more stability? That's one question for you. And uh, can you convert it to a reverse without changing the nail? That's a, another question for you. And I, 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 it's very interesting your comment that uh, the results of the operations they are better. Uh, uh, they they are not better from the conservative treatments because they they have lots of complications. So they are worse sometimes. And when we compare Hemi with reverse, reverse is better than Hemi, but Hemi is a catastrophe. So uh, you are uh, comparing the bad with the worse. So uh, I understand very much that. Uh, we need to to have a lot of uh, intelligence to um, to understand the fracture before doing the the operative treatment. So please, could you uh, tell us if we can convert your device to a reverse? Thank you for your comments, Dr. Almeida. So I will take the first question first. Uh, this st uh, it uh, I would call it a stem. It is not a nail. So this stem uh, can be converted into a hemi. And uh, uh, it is interesting. What you do is you, you the, for a fracture where the head has a high risk of avascular necrosis. So a four part fracture where there is no medial spike, which means the medial spike is less than six or eight millimeters where we know that there is a high risk of avascular necrosis, you take that head, make a hole in it, and you put it under a shell of a uh, metal head. I hope you understand, like a surface replacement, you have an implant along with this device, where the, where the patient's head is kept underneath that uh, cap. Base plates, yeah. Yes, and that head, you then mount it on the same stem. But sorry, just a second. Uh, that would behave mechanically as a hemi. Got Basically, it. as a hemi. Yeah, I just want you, uh, you see, uh, I'm, I'm, I am very impressed when people have good results with hemis because I'm, uh, as Dr. Hildeo has said, my results, they are catastrophical. They are extremely, no. uh, very bad. And just as a second, sir, doc, and, 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 uh, and then I want to listen to you, Dr. Hildeo, your uh, results as a rule with Hemi, they are very bad also, because my day are a tragedy. What about your uh, results you deal with Hemi's? Well, at the time that we, we did most of our Hemi's, uh, we, we were in the phase in Brazil that we did not have good implants. We had just uh, national implants and they were not tested over the time. So, uh, that's one thing that I, I, I understand why my reverses, uh, my, my hemis were not very good. The second is that I was just beginning my shoulder uh, experience. So it's very important to understand that the tuberosity fixation and uh, healing process is a, a key point for the, the success of hemis. 
And what I understand is it depends on what the patient expects. Because if you have a very old patient that needs to get uh, uh, you know, the head above, the, the, the hand above the head. So I prefer to go for a reverse. But if I have yeah. a young guy that needs rotation, I think hemis, they give more rotation than the reverse. So it depends on the patient for the, uh, the age and the uh, uh, what the patient expects from the procedure. Sure. To do. Sure, but see, but in spite of that, you are absolutely uh, sure. And, and in this sense, sir, when we have younger patients with failures of osteosynthesis, and then this becomes a big challenge because you don't have the idea of feeling comfortable of doing, uh, uh, I would say, a reverse because of, uh, of age. But just uh, before you, you, you compliment Dr. Sanjay, Kahera, any comments about that? And Hemis, because in my hands, Hemis is a tragedy. What about your point of view? Well, uh, I'm very happy to, to see that Dr. Sanjay, he talks the same language with me. I, I'm completely, completely right about that. He understands exactly what I think about the proximal humeral fractures. And I knew this device, uh, the Bilboke, I knew red, and uh, it seems a good solution. And uh, well, uh, he said one thing that it, it makes a big difference when you deal said, oh, is, uh, you, you need to understand the fractures, you need to do a CT scan to, uh, to understand what happened with the fragments. And Dr. Sanjay said, it's very easy to treat this kind of fractures with the Bilboke device. Why is very easy? Because when you understand that you lose bone in the metaphysis area, as I use with my device, it's really very easy to treat this kind of fracture. If you have to assemble, to put all the fragments in the, in the anatomical position, and you lose the fifth fragment, you lose the bone in the metaphysis, it's, it's sometimes impossible to, to put all the fragments in the, in the right place, you know? So this makes the, these kind of fractures difficult. Well, Answering your question about uh, hemis, 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 yeah, about hemis, my experience is very, very bad. I think it's like yours. I don't know if it's a hundred percent bad results, but it's uh, near a hundred percent. So I don't need any more. I don't do any more hemis. Uh, it's very, very rare because I use this display. And sometimes when you find a AVN, a necrosis of the humeral head, we do, we go to a reverse prosthesis. And what I see in my cases, maybe Dr. Sanjay can, can uh, say also, comment about that is, I don't know if because the device, the plate that you keep the, the humeral head in the position, you have a support in the humeral head. Even if you, if you have a necrosis, the deformity is not big. You can keep this uh, humeral head and have a, not a good, but so, so result, so good result in this kind of fracture. So I don't do uh, hemi anymore. If I have no option, so I have to do, if the patient is very young, very, very yeah. young, so I can see, but I don't remember when was my last uh, hemi arthroplasty because oh. the results are bad and you don't find the, the, you, you lose the great tuberosity. The hemiartroplasty is different 
from the Sanjay device, the Bilboquet device, you know, because you put the great and lesser tuberosity, you have the humeral head and the head, you have the shaft. You can heal this, this the great and lesser tuberosity can heal uh, in, this, in this position that is different from the hemiarthroplasty. I don't know if you understand if I answer your yes, question. Yes, yes. Uh, may I answer uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Almeida's uh, question, which is pending, and uh, what uh, Professor Kahera has just asked. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Almeida, first, this implant, uh, this uh, intramedullary stem, is not possible to make it into a reverse. That's your simple answer, not as yet. Uh, uh, can it be cemented? The first version was a cemented version. So if you can on table under image intensifier, if you have come to a conclusion that this is the height of the prosthesis, you put the locking screw, keep the height, and then you could cement it after having prefixed the height. Now, uh, may I share the screen for about uh, 60 seconds to show you the yeah. HEMI with this device? Uh, sure. Oh, sure, sure, before, before, I, before I show you, let me uh, inform you that HEMI, poor result, everybody agrees. But, but, but the main reason for the poor result is the unpredictable behavior of the tuberosity. Yeah. That's the, that's the main reason when you do HEMI. Including yeah. Pascal Bolus, 50% failure is because the tuberosity resorbs or the tuberosity does not unite or tuberosity flies away. So, but imagine a situation that you are able to get the tuberosity to heal most of the time. Then hemis will do well. But and let me now share the screen and show you the hemi with the just unique device. Yeah, sure. So can you can you see my screen, Sergio? Yes, yeah, sir, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. So what you do is in those cases where the risk of avascular necrosis is very, very high. So if you know Hubbard Resch study and the medial spike is very small, uh, which means for sure the uh, the artery is 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 gone. Uh, it's just the shell, and the patient is in the slightly older age group, say 60, 65, where you know this is undergoing to go avascular necrosis for sure, because number one, it's a fracture dislocation. Number two, there is no medial spike, so the uh, artery is gone. That is when you may want to do this instead of a just unique, which I showed you. So you take the head, as you can see, you make a hole, and that is the implant you will use. And you put the head in that implant. And now you put that head with the bone in it, the, the, the patient's head and the metal head, and you put it back onto that same stem, the same stem that I used for the bull bouquet technique. And then this is how it fits. And in these cases, the, and then you suture the tuberosities back and look how the tuberosity heals. Yeah. Wow. So, so but I would not do a hemi where I know that the avascular necrosis possibility is lesser, which means there is a large medial spike or the patient is very young, say uh, 48, 50, 52. But I will selectively use this when the head is just a shell without medial spike, where there is enough data in the literature to tell you that uh, uh, this is under, going to undergo avascular necrosis. So this is how you have a, 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 a tool to make a hole in that uh, head, and then you put it on the, under the metal head, like this. And that is how the construct is, yes? So now, uh, I think, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Professor, Sir Kahera, you asked a question. Can you just uh, help me remember? Repeat the question, please. Uh, no, I, I said that it seems for me that the even when you find a AVN, a necrosis of the humeral head, the deformity is not so big. And yes, yes, yes. You can you can find a good result 
even if you have uh, necrosis. I don't yeah. know how to explain this. this. Oh, I, I, I understand you. I understand you perfectly well. And I have a case in my discussion to show if the tuberosities unite, I repeat, if a, the tuberosities unite, then even if there is avascular necrosis of the head, patient is functionally reasonably okay. I agree. Sure. I agree with Professor Kahera completely. Sure, uh, oh. sir. No, no, no. So I just want to make. The book, yeah. No, I just want to make a comment. Even if, uh, even because I have uh, four similar cases in my in these fifteen years, or sixteen, and I just want the juniors to understand. I, I'm just going to put it in. A, a, I would say in a in a more easy to understand for the juniors, which is. In proximal humerus fractures, when you have AVN, many times we have a, a clinical hagiological dissociation, which means yes. a, a reasonable or even good uh, final clinical result with a very bad X-ray. I am having two cases now. And one of the reasons for that, uh, I, I want to know if you agree with me, Dr. Sanjay, is that the shoulder is not a hip. So when we think about the hip, the hip is a contraction joint and the shoulder is a distraction joint. So this is why, in my opinion, AVN in the femur, in the, in the, in the femoral head, would be a much more complicated issue than in the shoulder because we have a distraction. And uh, I would say as the hand is literally not touching the foot, the ground. Uh, gravity is always helping us in distracting the joint. And is in this sense, I would say that a very good uh, final clinical result is quite, it's not impossible, but it's not expected. But a reasonable one, as Dr. Carrera has said, is, ex uh, is possible. And when these things happen, the only thing we can do is to do nothing to observe and buy time and gain time, especially in the, in the uh, younger patients, until he starts to have a lot of pain, 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 and then we will have to think about something different and, and any kind of uh, arthroplasty. But the thing is, there is a clinical hagiographical dissociation, which I see a lot in my practice, and I don't know if it's like that in the hip, but much probably in the hip, AVN is, a, I would say, a more difficult uh, 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 problem, okay? And having said that, Dr. Ildeo, he wants to speak, and then I would like you guys to share your cases to uh, improve the discussion, and we can discuss the, re the uh, more real cases of uh, our daily practices. Dr. Ildeo, you just want to speak. I just want to point uh, two aspects. Um, one, uh, regarding HEMIS. Um, I am now a little bit more comfortable doing HEMIS than before. Because now we have these convertible systems. So if the HEMI fails, you can convert it to a reverse. The problem is that sometimes the cut, the ideal position of the stem for a hemi is not the same ideal position for the reverse. So this is something that you can't, um, you can't manage, but uh, I am more comfortable because if the hemi fails, I can convert it to a, a reverse. Well, the second thing is about the nearest classification for the juniors. So, the basic science that supports near classification does not exist. So when you, you talk about one centimeter or half centimeter or 45 degrees of rotation, uh, you, you have no basic science supporting these measurements. So probably we, we need a better classification system, but nobody was able to do that until now. So you young guys, think about that. And you have to do it for us. And, and the inter-observer and intra-observer agreement of this classification is very weak. 
So sometimes Dr. Carrera will, will say, oh, it's a four parts, and I will say it's a, it's a three parts. And yeah. it, it's difficult because we are going to treat based on the classification. So uh, finally, I think that the proximal humeral fracture based on that is very difficult to classify. So if it's difficult to classify, I think it's difficult to understand. And if it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to treat. And it's very difficult to expect reliable results. So you have to individualize each case. That's what we are going to do in the next few minutes. Uh, for the presentations. That's what I understand. Thank you. Just, just one comment, and I just want to know what, uh, what Dr. Carrera has said, because this is something that I have made in the last years by intuition. Every time I am operating a proximal humerus fractures, before I start, I do a dynamic analysis in the intensified, in the C-arm view, uh, especially with traction on the elbow. And I think that it it gives me complementary information uh, that can help me, uh, I would say, on my uh, construction, I would say, operatively. So this is something that for the juniors to keep in mind, every time you are doing a proximal humerus fractures, spend one minute, less than one minute, doing a very nice C-arm ev evaluation and, uh, and thinking about that the scapula is antiverted uh, 30 to 45 degrees. So you must properly position the C-arm in order to have an AP view, a true AP view, which means there is no sobreposition of the humeral head over the scapula. And, and having said that, with a little traction on the elbow, we can have complementary uh, information that can really help us understanding better the fracture, I would say intraoperatively just before we start cutting. Just one more thing before, uh, before we start seeing cases. Dr. Sanjay, you were telling us that you like to do this uh, Bilboke through the anterosuperior approach. Uh, but my question is, when you have involvement of the lesser tuberosity, you would have difficulties in uh, dealing with the subscap. What do you have to tell me about that, sir? In that sense, the delta pack wouldn't be a much better idea, Dr. Sanjay. No, uh, yeah. No, uh, I have been doing all my virgin primary reverses also through the superior McKenzie approach. Uh, okay. You do a few and you will realize that it is uh, no problem in accessing the lesser tuberosity at all, just okay. by rotating. And the incision is hardly about uh, two and a half to three inches to do the job. Uh, it's quite simple. There is no problem in accessing the lesser tuberosity and uh, you got to see one or two and do them uh, uh, to, to realize that. Uh, the only reason I would do a deltopectral, like I said in my talk, is where I have to operate on the shaft. Okay. There yes. is a oh, butterfly, butterfly or a, a extension of the fracture into the shaft. So I have to stabilize the shaft by doing a circlage or something. Uh, then I will be keen to do a delta pectoral. It makes a lot of sense, sir. But that's something for all of us to understand. If you're doing the anterior, the, the anterior superior approach, what about the axillary nerve, sir? I think this is a very good, a very good point. What about the axillary nerve? No, you don't. You don't go down as much. Axillary okay. nerve is about five centimeters from the lateral edge of acromion. You you don't need to go that much down. You don't have to split the deltoid all the way, and it's 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 a uh, uh, relatively safe. You just need to do a few to get the hang of it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So, sir, can you start sharing cases? And Doctor Kahira here, uh, just a, a second. Kahira, you have cases to show to uh, and to to discuss. Sure. Yes, I have two cases. Okay, but I guess you want to say something be before we start seeing cases. You want to say something. Kahira. Yes, yes, yes. I would like to make a comment about uh, the talk of Udeo. Udeo said a very important point that is the classification, the near classification. There is not a, a, the best classification or a unique classification to understand the fracture. And my point is that you need to read the fracture. 
how to read the fracture. You can use the, the classification A, the classification B, C, whatever. But you have, you need to understand before you start your treatment, your surgery, even if you will treat by surgery, you need to understand to read the fracture. So you can use the near classification to understand if there is, uh, there are two, three or four fragments or 40 fragments are Dr. Sanjay said, doesn't matter the number of fragments, you know, but you, you need to understand to, 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 to know the fragments and if there is bone loss, or if you, you find all fragments to put together to, to assemble. This is the point. You, you, you uh, need to read, to understand the fracture. That is the point. And you do said very well, uh, because there is no, uh, not a, a best classification for all kind of fractures. And uh, I would like to make one question for Dr. Sanjay. What do you mean the, the superior uh, approach? Because I use the anterolateral approach. I don't know if it's the same you are referring, but yes. uh, not the, the deltopectoral approach is two centimeter lateral. lateral. Yes, it's in the corner of the acromion. I go uh, in this position that I call anterolateral approach through the deltoid muscle. And in this position, there is not problem with the axillary nerve. But if you go very lateral, this is a little bit danger for the, 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 axillary, the axillary nerve. nerve. So I do a little bit anterior, but it's not deltopatrol approach. How, how is your approach, Dr. Sanjay? It is the antero superior, what you said. The antero lateral, what you said, same. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay, Dr. Kahira, he has one or two cases to show, but can, can, can we start with one of your interesting cases, sir? Okay. My, my case? Kahira? My case or Dr. Sanjay? So, I guess that- what I what, what I suggest, Sergio, is let Dr. Kahera show his two cases. And then I have many cases. I will keep showing till, <laughs> till, till Ashok and Neeraj tell us to stop. Oh, lovely. Lovely. I hope they, they give us a, a, a lot of time, please. But see, Kahera, you can start. Okay. Can you see my... my... Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, this is a male, 75 year old, is a physician, is our colleague, obstetrician. He fell, he fell on his right shoulder on October uh, 2018. And he presented ecchymosis and increase of volume in the right shoulder. And he had a very bad pain. The images are these, okay? So, what, what is the, the, the treatment? What is the, the indication for treatment? What are the comments? Any, any, Sergio, do you think that is good to, to make comments or I go ahead? Uh, what, what I would like, Kahira, uh, uh, I think that you can show the, your ideas and what you have done until the end, and then we can spend five or ten or ten minutes discussing all of the case. Uh, okay. can, can, I, can I interject, uh, Sergio? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, what sir, I like yes. is, let, let three of us, very short, brief, one line answer, okay. I will do this, I will do that, and then let Professor Kahira take over what he did. Okay. So, so I may I go first? Yes, you go first and then me and then Dr. I, uh, and, I, uh, and all three of us have to say only one line, five seconds, yeah? <laughs> so you start, sir. Okay, uh, obstetrician 75, I will do a reverse shoulder orthoplasty. 
Okay, so uh, the thing is, uh, I cannot, uh, I'm going to be very short, I cannot accept this because of the displacement of the, the greater tuberosity, which would get much probably much worse. I would fix it and I would not be very worried about the height of the fracture because the head shaft relation was not bad. I would be humble, put it down, put a phyllos, just uh, 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 get some height as possible and do a very slow rehabilitation. I prefer a stiff shoulder than loss of construction. I, I guess that this is important. Ildeu, your thoughts before Carrera go on, uh, goes on. Yeah, I understand it's a valgus impacted fracture. I don't know exactly if the medial hinge is intact. So based on the age and the deltoid index, which seems that this uh, bone is very weak, I would go for a reverse. But it's not... Uh, too bad to do uh, an open reduction internal fixation, but it, it seems that it's going to fail, so reverse. Okay. But let me ask you one thing, Sergio, for Dr. Sanjay and for you too. Uh, okay. You, 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 you gave the diagnosis and the treatment. My yeah. question is, don't you need a CT scan? Is enough this X-ray for you? The uh, thing I, is, I, I would do a CT scan in all proximal humerus fractures that I plan to operate. That's my routine. Okay. Uh, I would say that in this case, I think is very important. Whenever I have articular involvement, it's very important. And still, because it's very easy nowadays, I, I, I think that uh, 3D CT helps me a lot. It really helps me a lot. Okay. So just to comment that I said before, the compression in, in the metaphysis, are you seeing that the, the humeral head goes through the, the shaft? Is a compression, the, the, the great tuberosity, there is no place for the great tuberosity. You lose uh, uh, length in, in these kind of fractures. So, this is the 3D, and as I used to do, uh, it's not a difficult surgery. You always find the great and lesser tuberosity. You have to, to push, uh, to pull the, the, the humeral head. I like to do with my finger because the instruments usually uh, make some damage in the bone, in, in the metaphysis, that is uh, a very, very uh, smooth bone. So I found, I put the, the humeral head up and then I put a spacer, this kind of plate, to, to fill the gap, to fill the defect. And then you can close with the great and lesser tuberosity. The humeral head will find his exactly his anatomical place. And this is without any screw, but you can see that the humeral head goes a little bit up and you will find the place to put the great tuberosity. And this is the uh, final X-ray. Any comment? No, you, you see, it's not only beautiful, but uh, another thing that the juniors, they have to understand, it doesn't matter if you are using this plate or a phyllos like plate, we shall avoid subchondral screws because of the risk of intraarticular penetration. So uh, they are not very subchondral and this is very important. And still, I would say that somehow the inferior screw in the head it's behaving like a calcar screw, uh, I would say, in the phyllos. And I think that this gives a little bit more of stability, too. Yeah. And this, uh, if you could use the Bilboquet device, you, you find the right position of the humeral head, because this angle is the angle of the humeral head in relation to the shaft. Yeah. It's like the Bill Bouquet device. Yeah. 
Very nice. Yes. Very nice. Excellent. Uh, and well, did the patient have any avascular necrosis because it is now 18 months? No, no, no. No, oh. this is the guy that used to work in my hospital. Uh, and uh, I saw him uh, some days ago and he's doing very, very well. Okay, yeah. good. And Dr. Sanjay, just one more thing. Just one more thing. Uh, we have to, to understand that this patient is 75, but we have very different patients with 75 nowadays. We have very active people and we have people with low demand. So I think that it's not only about the age, but the, 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 the old personality of the case. So, so if this guy is working as an obstetrician, still trying to avoid a reverse is something to really think about. Huh? I think that the, in this sense, maybe uh, doing any, uh, a bilboke would also be uh, a very uh, good idea because of osteosynthesis in spite of primary arthropathy as a first choice, I mean. Sure, yeah, I agree. Okay. Go ahead. So, yes. Well, this is another, it's very similar, this case, but it's another male, 72 year old. He's retired, but he's a very active guy. He used to walk and play and do some exercise. And he fell also uh, with your uh, right shoulder. And this is the image, as uh, Dr. Ildeo told, that is very difficult to understand this kind of fracture just using the X-ray. But you need all, uh, most of the time the CT scan and you can see also the compression in the metaphysis area. This is very easy to understand that the humeral head went to the shaft. There is a compression in this part. And this is very interesting just to see. Always the fracture becomes like this, present like this. The humeral head is in the shaft. You have to push to, yes. to pull up yes. the uh, to push up the the head you see you push up the head and you find a place to put the great and lesser tuberosity but you have to fill this gap otherwise you you lose the position again so you have a gap i put the plate that is a spacer could be the bioboke also but in the, 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 the position of the plate uh, gives already the, the right position of the humeral head. And then you close the great and the lesser tuberosity as you close in uh, arthroplasty, in a prosthesis. You, you, you uh, create a space to uh, fix the great tuberosity. And that is the, the uh, final position. This is uh, another very uh, uh, generation of this plate. I changed during the time, but is, this is the final result. Any comments? Uh, I, I just want to make something. Uh, I guess that this is an important comment. Carrera, can you keep the, uh, the, uh, the X-ray, please? The X-ray? No, 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 the X-ray, the, the post-op. Post post X-ray. Yeah. Ah, the final one. The full stop. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The only thing that I think is that don't you think that the upper screw could be a locket screw? I think that because the chances of the screw pulling out, they are not very small in my understanding. So in this sense, using this screw as a locket screw would be, I would say, a big advantage. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, you are right, Sergio. And you know uh, my situation here in Brazil. And yeah. uh, we have no um, um, factor to, to make this kind of plate. I asked for a dentist to, to odontologic uh, factor to make this plate. And I had to improve to, to uh, use what I have. Uh, yeah. to use this kind of plate. This is well, the first generation 
of this plate, you know? So I have to adapt this plate sure. and the screws. The screws is not for this plate also. But the point is the, that I would like to, to, to say, you need to fill the, the gap. The gap. You need even this screw. I don't know what is the, the Dr. Sanjay experience, but if you put the plate without a screw, you can get a good stabilization if you close the great and lesser tuberosity, Morality. as Dr. Half Hertel said. When you close the great and lesser tuberosity, the humeral head stays inside the joint and you fill the gap all the system becomes stable. Do you understand? I have a, I, yeah, I have a question from Professor Kahera. Yes. Uh, is it possible to remove this implant if you were to do a reverse for some reason a few years later without breaking the tuberosity? <laughs> Very good question. Yes. Yes, that is a good question. All the presentations I do all over the world, everybody asks this question. <laughs> you are right. But maybe you have this experience also. When you close the great and lesser tuberosity, there is a, a very bad tissue between the great and lesser tuberosity. If you need to take out this plate, you open a very small window between the great and lesser tuberosity, you take out all the screws and switch the plate without lose the, the great and lesser tuberosity or the fracture. I have to do this in some cases that I, I had the infection, but the, I, I took out the plate after three weeks, almost three weeks, and the fracture was healed and I didn't lose the position. Do you understand? Yeah. And yeah. also, and also one, one, another point, the angle of the superior blade, the blade in the plate is uh, 135. It's like the angle of the prosthesis. And yeah. if you have a necrosis and you need to take out the humeral head to change for a prosthesis, you, you can do the osteotomy of the humeral head using the plate is very easy. I think it's similar to the Pubokke device yeah. that you could use the humeral component just to change for a prosthesis, even a, a, a reverse prosthesis. That Dr. Yu, they will ask you in the first in the first talk, Dr. Yudeo said, but can you use the, the humoral uh, component the, not to change him? I think you can think about that. You don't need to change because the angle of the humoral head uh, is in the plate is, is the same of the prosthesis. Do you understand? So, yeah, yeah. What you mean, if I understood, is that uh, uh, you can use the plate as a landmark to do the right cut of uh, of the humerus to do a reverse. I, I this is what I understood, and I think that there is logic in that. And maybe what I'm thinking now is that you can also use not your your uh, your clinical view, but also the C arm to make this marking intraoperatively. But I, I just want to make to say something to the juniors, and I want. Dr. Sanjay to comment because uh, again, there are many uh, young surgeons seeing this. So the idea, when we started doing reverses about 20, especially 15 years ago, uh, it was made for a rotator cuff deficient, uh, deficient shoulder with no more cuff in a pseudo paralytic shoulder. But in spite of that, the idea is that whenever possible, Doing a, a reverse doesn't mean that you have to throw the, the remaining cuff in the bucket. So if you preserve it, it's very wise. Uh, and that was the message that Dr. Sanjay was trying to mention. Am I correct, Dr. Sanjay? Quite right. I agree with you. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, it does make a big difference, Sergio. So if you don't need to, to, to move the great to gross, it is, in my opinion, make the big difference. But you see this kind of play. This is another version. Now, uh, here you can find the, the, the screws are uh, on the plate. Yeah. Uh, answer your first question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Sanjay, can you show your very interesting cases? Uh, uh, Dr. Carrera's case was very nice. And what matters in the end is a very final, uh, good clinical result. For the juniors to understand, we have to, to uh, differentiate. This is an, another way of speaking. We have head preserving and non head preserving and head replacing uh, procedures. So, Dr. Carrera, in this, uh, I would say, 70 plus patients, they were active. So, he was thinking about head preserving uh, 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 procedures. And as we know, the bone is better than a piece of metal in the hip, in the knee. So in this sense, this is what Dr. Ildeo was mentioning. Whenever you can uh, preserve the humeral head, this is absolutely welcome, as long as the rotator cuff is working in an osteosynthesis. And when you are doing a, an, a, a reverse, you can leave it if possible. And, and, and if you uh, take it away, of course, it's not a problem. So, uh, uh, Dr. Yudeo, before uh, Dr. Sanjay speaks, do you want to say something ab about all of these things? Yes, uh, uh, just some comments about this second case of Dr. Skahira. Uh, I understand that this fracture is different from the other because the first one which was a valgus fracture and this one is a varus fracture. And basically what I understood I learned from the fractures, as Dr. Carrera said, we have to understand the fracture. That in the first one, in the valgus one, we had the medial hinge intact. In the second one, we, we had the medial hinge damaged. So in my opinion, the second case is much more complex because yep. the instability is not very good. And it's very, I'm very impressed as we have treated both different cases using the same methods. So uh, this is something that uh, uh, the literature uh, uh, do not understand like that, but the result was good. So uh, Carrera, uh, I think your, your plate is a very good one. I have to congratulate you because the difficulties of doing this kind of job in Brazil, I've done a, a distal humerus prosthesis, an elbow prosthesis, and I, I could not put him on the market because these difficulties. So I congratulate you. And uh, one thing about uh, uh, the cut, using the plate as a reference, as a guide, because yes. when you put the plate, you do not think about retroversion. Yeah. And, uh, if you are going to do a hemi or a reverse, the, the, the cut for the retroversion is a little bit different. So. Sometimes you just can't use the plate as a guide. So uh, I have to, uh, you, you study very well before doing that. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing, Dr. Sanjay, before you start is that in some reverses, you have a device with some pins to put in the forearm to guide your uh, retroversion. So I think that this is something that the juniors, they can keep in mind. Dr. Sanjay, you have a lot of experience to, just mention that be, before you start putting your cases, sir, about uh, in difficult cases, using the forearm as a guide uh, to understand the proper retroversion of the humeral head, especially in revision cases, sir. Do you think that this is an advantage or uh, an, another tool? Yeah, I often look at the proximal humeral anatomy and Every patient's version is different. Yeah. If you look at Jill Walsh's paper on humoral anatomy, the variation is from antiversion of 6.7 to retroversion of 45 degrees. Wow. So I look at the, uh, it's, a, it's a hexagon, the anteromedial cortex and the posterior cortex of the proximal humerus where they meet is the retroversion of that patient. So this is another tip you can use when you are looking at the proximal humerus where these two cortices meet, that's the calcar. Okay. 
and that is the retroversion in that patient. Yeah, which is different from one to another, and we have to respect it, especially to gain stability in the in the glenosphere. Because, as you mentioned, sir, uh, if you do it wrong and you have an unstable reverse, this is a mess. Uh, it's very difficult. Big, big to, trouble. Big trouble. It's a big, big trouble. Hopefully, I never had it. Thanks God. I am doing. I am doing the retroversions uh, nicely, even in the few revisions cases uh, that I have done. But you see, it's difficult. In my opinion, it's not easy because of fibrotic tissue and you and you uh, lose the normal anatomy. So what you have said makes a lot of sense. So right. now you, you share your cases, sir? Yeah. May I request that all of you uh, try and give a very short, simple, quick answer. Uh, so yeah. the, the, I, the, the, the reason I say that is not being uh, abrupt, but uh, so that we can show more cases in limited sure. time. So sure. I'm going to share my screen. Sergio, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, sir. So here is a 65 year old male. Uh, he was working on his model aircraft that he owns and he injured his shoulder. Okay. So, uh, Professor Kahira, what would you do? Considering the age, 65 years old, I would try to fix this fracture, uh, put the, the humeral head in the right place and fix using my my plate if if it's possible if okay. it's the older one i i will prefer a reverse prosthesis but it's very young i prefer to do the osteosynthesis okay uh uh dr almeida any different or same four parts fracture dislocation open reduction internal fixation okay uh, Sergio, for you, any different or same? Open reduction, no, no. internal fixation, or anything different? It's the I'll, same. I'll no, 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 no. It's the same. It's the same. Just uh, two very far, uh, first point. Uh, we have to establish the diagnosis. I learned that with Cajera very strictly uh, 15 years ago. So just for the juniors to understand, this is a three-part anterior fracture dislocation. We have to have these ideas in mind. And I would consider, to be very honest with you, uh, the, use, uh, the uh, use of a, a, a tricortical iliac piece, if needed, as an intraoperative decision. I'm quite sure that Ildeo has said the same thing uh, 20 seconds ago. Okay. Sergio, Sergio, yeah. one minute. Can yeah. I disagree? I think it's a four-part fracture. Oh, okay. In this sense, in this sense we, uh, a CT would be elemental. Okay, so uh, I will go ahead and this was treated by somebody, not me, uh, uh, in the city of Mumbai. And he did what you guys said, he did a uh, open reduction and internal fixation. Uh, just a quick answer, uh, does it look reasonable to you, Sergio, the x-ray? Is it, is it a reasonable job? Uh, yes, but I, I just want to make two comments and I am very strict about it. First of all, the screws seem uh, a little bit longer to me. I'm very worried about it. Literature is clear about it. And second, what I would think is that we should see in the end of the surgery uh, an AP view in external rotation because then you put the retroversion of the humeral head in front of you and you can have a, a better uh, and you can have a better view of the reduction of the medial hinge. But so far, the head shaft is in a wonderful position. It's a good job. The only issue is the screws should be, especially the uh, 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 the upper screws, a little bit smaller. But it's, okay. it's a, a good job, a right. very good job. Professor Kahira, any comments? Uh, reasonable? He thinks it's a good job, but uh, it depends how he uh, did this uh, fixation. Because if you lose, if you damage a lot of uh, vascularization. Uh, the, uh, so this uh, humeral head can be to uh, necrosis. Okay. Can go to necrosis. Dr. Almeida, any any more comments than the other two speakers? 
Yeah. For me, the plate is in the position of the greater tuberosity, and the greater tuberosity is posterior displaced, and the medial hinge is not very stable. So I fear for this fracture. Yeah. Okay. So the patient comes now to me after five months. Okay, it was treated by somebody. He comes to me at five months. His complaint is he has got severe pain and very stiff. He can barely move his shoulder. And if he tries to move, he has a lot of pain. So let's start with uh, now Dr. Almeida. Uh, what will you do? What are your thoughts? It seems that uh, I, I don't have a um, true AP view. It seems that it might be a little bit subluxed anteriorly. And okay. the greater tuberosity is not healed. I th it seems to be a, a non-union of, of the greater tuberosity. Sergio, your take? Sir, uh, I fully agree. And I would say that uh, I think that a true AP view of the shoulder would give me much more uh, information. I'm worried about if this uh, humeral head is anteriorly luxed or subluxed and still I would be very worried about uh, post uh, traumatic okay so I did a CT no, scan no, boys no okay. no just a, a second sir sir just a, a, a second the thing is the humeral acromial space it's much bigger than it should be so maybe we are having a cuff deficiency too. So this is something for us to think about. No, the, the, okay, so this is, I got a CT scan done and this is what it looks like. Now, uh, this is your baby, Professor Kahira. What will you do? <laughs> well, uh, in the fracture revision, I don't like to, to try again the osteosynthesis because the kind of bone is very, very bad, and sometimes almost of the it goes to a necrosis. So, in this case, I would think in a revision with a, a reverse prosthesis. Okay, so some tips about the difficulty uh, with that glenoid uh, fractured piece putting the uh, base plate. You think uh, it will be easy, or you will have to graft that area? What do you think? when you do the reverse? Sir, uh, a very small comment because I faced a similar case two years ago and I studied that a, a lot. Uh, you, can, you can try to do it, but and you see, I am not doing publicity of any implant. This is just a technical issue. There is one reverse available in Brazil from FH Orthopedics developed by Filippi Valenti with a, a longest peg for revision. So this is a prime in which you can lock it until the, the almost, uh, I would say, uh, much better in the scapula. So in this sense, just uh, listen to me. This is a primary reverse with the difficulties of a revision. In this sense, uh, any reverse with a, biggest, with a bigger peg would be a very wise, uh, a, a very wise uh, option in the uh, in the reverse, the problem here is not the version, but the bone loss. So a bigger a bigger peg, and we have implants for uh, with this a bigger uh, peg. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It so, would be a very nice idea. Dr. Almeida, would you also uh, same answer or different? Would you want to reconstruct I, this glenoid? I have faced cases like that, few cases, and I have used the humeral head as a graft to fulfill the glenoid defect. And saying about the, the peg, the long peg of the metal plate, I would use it for a structured allograft because if I use it in the primary procedure, probably we are going to damage the scapula and penetrate it. So it, it's related to, to uh, less, um, to more complications. Okay, the okay. patient was lost to follow up, but I am told that he has he has undergone reverse shoulder orthoplasty somewhere in the world. Now we move to the next case. Thank you, gentlemen. Sec case number two. You have a male, 27 years old. He had a proximal humerus fracture. 
he went to an orthopedic surgeon and he did this kind of a locking nail. I'm sorry, I don't have the pre-operative x-rays. Then the whole thing failed and the same surgeon then did a uh, uh, arthroplasty with CTA head, which is cuff tear arthroplasty head. Now the patient comes to me with severe pain and very little poor function. He's 27 years old. So your take, let's start with Dr. Almeida first. <laughs> yes, this is a very difficult case because- You do, send to India, send it to India to be treated there. <laughs> Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay, listen to me. As this is the biggest nightmare possible, the best way is send this patient from Sao Paulo to Mumbai. I'm gonna pay the air ticket, but only to go, not to come back. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Okay, so this patient is 10 months mm -hmm. since this hemi, cuff tear, arthropathy, head, severe pain and stiffness. So Professor Kahira, what will you do? 27 years. Dominant hand. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. Really, I don't know. But uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe change this this prosthesis for a prosthesis with well, that is a big head uh, prosthesis, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is a prosthesis uh, with a. The head is meant for cuff deficient hemis. Well, yeah. I, I spoke. I spoke to the surgeon. He said there was very no cuff. It was totally destroyed. So I did a, a CTA. It is called cuff tear arthropathy head. So Sorry. anyway, just, just I did a CT sure. scan, and on CT scan, this is what the glenoid is like. The the, the hemi was in a grossly retroverted position. The glenoid was eroded, and this is the status of the glenoid. Now, what will you do? What, what, what is his profession? What he does? Uh, he, is a, uh, he does a desk job in some company. He's not a manual laborer, but he is very upset with the surgeon because he has done two operations with him, and this is the condition. He can barely move his arm. Sir, uh, well, yes. I, 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 I don't know really what to do. I don't know really what to do, but I think uh, I could take out this prosthesis, live without prosthesis, put a, a graft in the scapula, in the glenoid, to, to increase the bone in the glenoid, to think Maybe if it, if it's if it's too bad, the result is too bad. Uh, I could uh, think in uh, reverse prosthesis later. In okay. two times, Sergio. Sergio, your turn. Sir, the thing is, one of the worst cases I have ever seen in my life. But I would, I, I think there is a space to have a very honest talking with this guy. And considering, I've never done in my life, but considering. An arthrodesis, you know, uh, I think that it's not, it's not a sin only to think about it, okay? Uh, I, I don't know what you have done, but only in this case, only, a, a, I would say, a, a reverse with a lot of difficulties, but to think about an arthrodesis is not a sin. But uh, Sergio, you think arthrodesis will be easy with the head osteotomized, the glenoid like this? No. No, I have never done in my life an arthrodesis. I hope I never do, but that would be a very difficult one. So in this sense, you see, doing a reverse with all of the difficulties would be the best solution and pray not only for a reasonable result, but for that reverse to last for a reasonable time. For okay. us to postpone a revision, the more the better. Dr. Almeida, just a quick, uh, uh, your suggestion. The French guys, they have uh, a solution for that, which is a ball. 
just to put a ball inside it and, and leave it. The other position I will do here is just to take it out and to suture the soft tissues around like a Jones procedure, and that's it. Okay, so I did revise the, the humeral prosthesis. I corrected the version. I had to do a linear osteotomy to remove the old prosthesis correct the version, put it in the right position, took the patient's autograph from the iliac crest. I reconstructed the glenoid, and this is what the glenoid looks like after about six months from this revision surgery. So I have managed to, and I have told the patient that I will do your surgery in two stages. Stage one, correct the version, put it in the right place, graft the glenoid, and then as and when you want, we can do a reverse at a later date. The later, the better as you grow older. So he has not yet come back for a reverse because he is quite just now reasonably comfortable with the pain relief. So he's carrying on like this till he's ready for a reverse. What about his function now, sir? What about it, his function? It is a cuff deficient hemi. I know. So, so, so his function is not very good, but he's able to yeah. do uh, some work at his, uh, you know, a little above the umbilical level. Uh, but his pain relief is, is reasonable at the moment with this, what I have done. And now, as you can see, the glenoid is quite okay to do a reverse as and when he says so. Yeah. But I have not done a reverse so far on this guy. Sir, sir, excuse me. S excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, you, you, you've done it, of course, with a delta peco. Okay, no, no discussion. But uh, yes. besides the delta pack, you use it a posterior accessory approach to to reconstruct the glenoid, or it was all through delta pack. All through delta pack. Okay, but very difficult, ah, huh? very difficult. It is challenging, but yes, you can you can do it. You can do through percutaneous, uh, you know, incisions posteriorly because the glenoid yes. is in front of you, just for passing the yes. screw purpose. The screws, yeah, yeah, sure. Case number three, 24 year old male. This is for the British preferred trial people. They say conserve everybody. So somebody really followed the advice. This is in some Southern part of India. And he had a, looks like whatever three or 3.5 part fracture. Conserved, <laughs> <laughs> conserved. And this is the result. We must send this X-rays to the preferred trial. Now, patient so, has some pain and uh, limited function. Uh, what will you do? Let us start with Sergio. Sergio has a vast experience. This patient was asking about you that can I go to Sergio in Brazil? No, see, sir, uh, I have experience with these situations because I received many chronic cases in my, in my hospital. The thing is what we have to understand, this is not AVN at least yet. And I'm quite sure that we don't have a post-traumatic uh, glenohumeral arthritis. So in this sense, uh, I, uh, I would uh, make a surgery just to reposition, just to reposition uh, the greater tuberosity, which is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a, a greater tuberosity osteotomy. So far, I have five cases. And believe, in, uh, believe me or not, this is just... A, uh, uh, I would say about repositioning the posterior superior cuff. Besides that, I would definitely do a bicep stenodesis if it was not done before. And I have a lot of experience. I would just do it with trans osseous uh, sutures, absolutely no implants. Maybe, even maybe, I'm, I, I don't know if I am just treating my mind and abductions link just to diminish the tension over the posterior superior cuff. And I would say that a reasonable uh, result could be expected. It's, it's just okay. about repositioning the Got it. Got it. Professor K K Kahira, uh, you want to add or subtract anything? Would you osteotomize the head? No, no, I agree with Sergio. I would like to, posi to better position the great tuberosity to prepare for uh, prosthesis in the future. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Almeida, would you say to this patient, look, there is nothing we can do, go away? No. Or would you also do a tuberosity osteotomy? 
No. I understand that in this case, what is displaced is not the greater tuberosity, it's the head. But I, under, I agree that it's very difficult to do a head osteotomy and to correct the position because it's in volgus. So the, the papers related to these treatments, they show bad results, whatever you do. So I would say to the patient that the result is, is unpredictable and I would probably try to do the same, but uh, thinking that the biomechanics will never be normal again. I, I, I admire and I fully agree with you. That paper is published by Pascal Beaulieu and team that after 20, uh, you know, after a united, malunited tuberosity, you do a corrective osteotomy, the results are not good no matter what uh, you do. So, but anyway, this patient was keen uh, that is his uh, further images of the CT scan and the MRI. And I did go ahead. I was brave. I did an osteotomy, uh, like Sergio said. Uh, I did a double row surgery, like rotator cuff, put anchors in the head and tied it over the post because the lateral row anchor uh, wouldn't uh, be solid fixation in the cortex. So I use a screw with a washer as a, as a post. And... The patient was quite happy. He had a 94% constant score two years post-surgery. Uh, sir, sir, sir. Uh, just one comment for the juniors. There is a very similar technique uh, made here in my city, which is called the parachute technique with this screw as a post. So just for the juniors to understand, uh, you are passing some sutures below the post. Uh, yes, sir. So yes. you are yes yeah. around, around the washer. Yes. So this is just for the juniors to understand, and this is a very wise, wise uh, way of doing it. My question is: You've done it through a delta pack. Yes. Okay. Because just for the juniors to to understand, this is a very important issue. If you do, a, a, I would say a deltoid split here. It's very nice to deal with the greater tuberosity, but putting this washer, you have to take a lot of care with the axillary nerve. This is a message for the juniors. And with a delta pack, you don't have to worry about the axillary nerve. So Dr. Sanjay was very wise to, to choose the, uh, I would say, um, a delta pack in spite of a deltoid plate. Right. So uh, in the interest of time, I have many, many more cases, but I will show only one more. And then perhaps yeah. uh, we might be running out of time. So this yeah. is an uh, orthopedic registrar uh, who was uh, on a Sunday going on a motorcycle. He had a fall and this is his x-ray. Uh, quick diagnosis, any one of you, Sergio? Excuse me, sir. Uh, 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 can you ask me again? Uh, a quick diagnosis, orthopedic registrar fell from the motorcycle. Sir. See, uh, it seems to be a posterior dislocation, but yes, definitely it I need... Yes, it yeah. is. Okay, well done. So here is the X-ray CT, sorry, the CT scan. Uh, it's a posterior dislocation and you can see the fracture pattern. So let us start with uh, uh, Dr. Almeida. What will you do? Open reduction, internal fixation, it, depending on the gap, on the defects of the humeral head, I would transfer the lesser tuberosity to the gap or subscap to the gap. And internal fixation using what implant? Screws. You mean plate and screws? Yes. No, or only screws sometimes. Only screws. Okay. Uh, 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 Dr. Professor Kahira, what will you do? Yes, I would like to reduce and fix with plate and screws also. Okay, and Sergio, sir, your turn. Sir, sir uh, the only thing is that in this case, in this case, this is rather than a typical, rather than a typical, I would say, two-part posterior fracture uh, dislocation or three-part posterior fracture uh, dislocation. This is a head split, so this is adding more difficulty to the case. So maybe, but this is an intra-op decision, maybe put in one or two cannulated screws to fix, to fix the head split as an intra-op decision and then put in a plate. 
but you okay. see can uh, I, it's can an I infra make, opposition sure can i make can i make a comment yes uh, please sir. i think in this case you have to be care uh, with the the humoral head because it's posterior sometimes if you have difficult to reduce the the head uh, i suggest to make a small incision posterior to push the humeral head and makes easier the reduction and you keep the the integrity of the humeral head got sorry. it so dr sanjay yeah uh, so I my, have, yeah sorry no no just a, a second this is very important uh, I asked you if you have made a, a, a posterior accessory incision, but I have a lot of experience with this. What you can do, see, if you, if you break this tiny humeral head, everything is gone. So what you can do is a, it's not a, a posterior incision, it's almost a percutaneous incision like the posterior portal of arthroscopy. And I enter with a hemostat, an artery forceps, very, very slowly, you and, and, and I open it to open the posterior capsule, and then I reduce it, and that uh, gives me, I would say, a lot of uh, help. So doing a posterior accessory incision, two centimeters or even percutaneous <laughs> the portal, it's very wise. Dr. Carrera is absolutely correct. I do it, and I fully advise that. Okay, so the head of department who is 75 year old senior man, he called me on a Sunday, this happened, that Sanjay, I want you to come and do this boy's shoulder. And he was standing behind during the surgery. So I reduced it. I did a deltopectoral approach. I used only anchors and ethibond to reduce the head and the tuberosities and used no metal. The head of department was pushing me. Don't you want to put any plates and screws? I said, no, sir, please excuse me. Uh, yeah. Leave it with just anchors. I call it the concept of controlled aggression and see the result. Very good. This is 15 months post-op. And this registrar is a naughty boy. He's telling me even my ACL is gone. Can you do it same time? <laughs> <laughs> So I did his ACL as well. And he okay. has 100% shoulder function. Now, before I sign off, I'm just gonna show, I will not, if you, just to save time, because we discussed this point earlier. This 32 year old male had a fracture dislocation in the Middle East. Uh, I think it was Dubai or uh, Saudi Arabia. And they did a fixation like this over there. He comes to me a few months later. I made sure I put everything back in position, including the tuberosity, though it is not very visible here. 32 year old. This was the original fixation. I revised it, put it back. And then I removed the implant. and. And of course, the head was avascular, as is expected with this kind of a fracture. But look at his function. And this is what I was saying. If you manage to get the tuberosity to heal, like it has healed in this case, see the greater tuberosity. He is almost six years since surgery with the AV, and he is quite happy. He has got almost 80 above constant score. So if you get the tuberosities to heal, in spite of an AVN, patients can do quite well. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, with this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think we are running out of time. Uh, appreciate uh, Sergio, Dr. Almeida, and Professor Cajera. It was a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Okay, so see, uh, Niraj, are you there, Niraj? No, ni I'm Niraj. Here. No, excuse I'm me, Niraj. I'm here. Shock. Yeah. No, no, okay, because you see, we are about two hours and 10 minutes now. Uh, so uh, I guess we have to finish it. Just tell me. Yeah. If yeah? You, you can take 10 minutes more if you have something important to finish. No, the thing is, we have seen many cases. Uh, we have seen many cases. The first thing is that I, I would really... Uh, 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 I would say thank all of the presenters here, Dr. Sanjay, it's a pleasure to talk to you, 
we, uh, and I, I'm really eager to meet you, sir, when I, I, I go to India again after all of these pandemics. Uh, it's very nice to see your experience and uh, sharing it with us. Uh, just to make some comments, we, uh, especially for the juniors, we understood the importance of uh, understanding uh, the gap between the head chef and the importance of the medial hinge. And one thing that I learned today is that uh, Dr. Sanjay, he made me understand why I have some cases with, uh, it's, uh, it's not many cases, thanks God, thanks uh, uh, God, but uh, with AVN and with a good uh, function. And that's because greater tuberosity has healed and the posterior superior cuff is working. I wasn't aware of that, but that makes sense. And even though, uh, as I have said again, I'm, I'm telling to the juniors, there is a distraction force over the, uh, uh, the shoulder. And this is, in my mind, uh, one of the reasons why we have a, a big uh, clinical radiological dissociation in between AVN around the shoulder. Besides that, I'm very happy. Uh, I'm very happy with Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Carrera, Dr. Ildeu. Uh, and I want you guys to make your final statements. And then I have just one thing to announce uh, before we finish. So, Carrera, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Your final statement, please. Your, your microphone, the microphone. Your microphone. Sorry, sorry, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I would like to thank all the support from India, from our colleagues from India, Dr. Nirai, Dr. Ashok, thank you very much for the support. And I especially would like to thank Dr. Dr. Sanjay. I learned a lot with him. He is a very experienced surgeon. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to be together with him. And also for our colleagues from Brazil, Dr. Yudeu, thank you very much for your comments. And Sergio, a special thanks for you to invite me to this presentation. Thank you for everybody. Okay, lovely. Dr. Yudeu, uh, just for people to understand, Dr. Yudeu, it's, I would say, bonded to me hand in hand in this Indo-British uh, I would say webinars and uh, he's helping me too much and he's going to be with me in the, uh, but I'm going to make the announcement before we finish. But Dr. Ilde, we want to listen to you uh, before we finish the, this event. I would like to congratulate Ortho TV and Shoulder Planet for this meeting. And Dr. Sanjay, it was great. I have learned about from you, thank you. And Dr. Carrera, uh, we know each other from a lot of time. And uh, every time we meet, uh, I learn from you as well, thank you. And Sergio, uh, you are a great guy doing this job. And uh, it's a very important to have these two countries doing these scientific events together. So go on, congratulations, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, before we start, be, be, before we finish, uh, I want to thank all of the delegates. I don't know, uh, Dr. Ashok, do you have uh, a, an idea, just as a curiosity, how many people were seeing us or not? Uh, nearly 2,500 people. So that you see, yeah. so 2,500. So I'm yes. very happy with that. You see, uh, on the first one, we had 1,000. Huh? Yeah. And now, and, and now we have 2.5 times more. This is a present to me. And this is, I would say, a, a way for us to see that uh, people are uh, being benefited with these events. Yeah. So uh, I'm very happy with this number. Uh, yeah, I was really expecting uh, a good audience, but not so much people. This is a present to me, a big present to me. Having said that, I just want to make an announcement that we will have, I don't know when, but we will have a third Indo-Brazilian Shoulder Planet and Ortho TV 
event, uh, excuse me, uh, a shock. Yes. No, no, no. Uh, there is a calendar appearing in front of me. Yes. No, it's you. Sorry? No. Uh, so uh, just a, a second. Just a second. Okay, just a second. Oh, no, I am back uh, again. Okay. Okay. So the thing is, uh, I just want to make an announcement that we will have a third event. Okay. I don't know uh, when. It will be the third Indo-British shoulder, uh, Indo-Brazilian shoulder planet and Orto TV event uh, with the presence of Dr. Daniel Moya, our good friend, the current president of Argentinian Society of Shoulder and Elbow, and who was the president of uh, International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery last year in Buenos Aires. I have talked to him, Dr. Rildeu is helping me in that. He accepted. He has a huge experience in AC joint dislocations, uh, doing a lot of different things. And he will talk about that. We will find Niraj is helping me in finding a very good name also from the Indian scenario. Uh, uh, and, and we will uh, have one or two lovely speakers to, to, to be in that and we will discuss that. And so I'm very happy we will have a third event with a big name like, like Dr. Daniel Moya. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank Niraj and Ashok. Without them, nothing of this would be happening. It's a present to me. And I think that uh, these collaborative events are very helpful. Just my final statement, Dr. Sanjay, he said, we have a lot of similarities in between India, Brazil. Uh, we don't speak Hindi, you guys, you don't speak Portuguese, but in spite of that, uh, we have a lot of similarities. So we are all in the same level, growing together. So this is a present to me and uh, see you guys in the next event. We will find a, a good date with Niraj, Dr. Ashok. It's gonna be outstanding. I don't know if Niraj wants to say something and, and Dr. Ashok before we finish it. No, I think you have said it all. Thank you everyone okay. and bye-bye. Thank you, Thank, you, Thank, you, Thank you, Brazilian friends. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Ashok and Neeraj. Thank you.